Hi, Tom. How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> I haven't been to the, um, I haven't been to the, hi Joe, hi Miles, well, thank you for joining us. Um, I haven't been to the, the Friday socials in ages, I've been so busy, I miss them, they're really, really fun. Yeah, that's okay, that's okay. Hello Walter, thank you for joining us. Um, oh no, I've said hello to Walter, sorry, I thought you were new, hang on, who, who, somebody else is new, hello Peter. That's the new person. Hi, thanks for joining us, Peter. So you're going away anywhere? Well, I don't suppose you have to to get the, the, the heat, do you? No, yeah, I'm going to have to go. I've got like um, family on the Isle of Wight, so occasionally we just go and stay with them. That was like one of the first, so we were, we were over there a few weeks ago. That was quite fun. But, um, Riviera. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, yeah I, think, I think that last time I went there, I was probably about three or something. <laughs> it hasn't changed. <laughs> <Is> it, <right? laughs> no, I can imagine. Oh, I was at the Isle of Wight in 1970. Oh, yeah? The concert, Jimmy Hendrix. Oh, Jimmy amazing. Uh, it was a wonderful concert. It changed my life. You're going to like me, Joe, because my current album in lockdown has been a tribute to Jimi Hendrix because I'm a lefty guitar player and I play a strap. So drop me your email. I'll send you a copy for nothing. So yeah, I'd love to hear. What was he like? Because he was supposed to be on acid that night, and he was just. He wasn't very good. It was great to see him, but it it, it was a bit disappointing, really, you know. Mm. Um, but uh, we were just after he came on after Leonard Cohen, so we we're all nearly half asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and at that stage, you know, we had to wake up of mates, you know, to see oh Hendrix is on, you know. But they also had Free at that concert. I love Free. Were, uh, Paul Kossoff. Yeah, yeah, oh. It was lovely. It was it's very talking my language. Right, you know? Yeah. They were really a great sad. band. And everyone was doing the peace signs. You know? Yeah, sure, sure. And of course, this, you put your foot in another guy's blanket, you turn around and look at him. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> everyone was lying, crashing out in the, hang out in the, in the grass. You know? It was a great concert. Great experience. To hell with the lesson. Can we just talk about like great concerts we've all been to? I, I think... I'd enjoy that a bit more. <laughs> well, what, what concerts were you at, is it? Yeah. Um, what's my best concert if I really had to... Oh, it's hard. I saw Buddy Guy live a few years ago before he started getting old. Amazing. B.B. King as well in his younger days. I saw Gary Moore twice. I, do you know the Beano album with uh, John Mayle, which had Eric Clapton on? Um, I saw the anniversary of that, and I said to my dad, it was my birthday when I was like 13, so a long time ago, I was like, Dad, I know Gary Moore and it's the Beano album, but that's Gary Moore in the corner warming up. He's going to come on with John Mayer. He's like, no, son, that's just some other guitarist. I was like, no, it's him. And sure enough, Gary Moore came out and just floored it. Great guitar player. Really? We have the Rory Gallagher as well. Oh, love him. From Rory was grew up in our town, you know? Really? I have to come see you because my godson, uh, he's not my official, my unofficial godson is called Rory, named after Rory Gallagher. Um, my guitar, the guitarist in my band named his kid Rory after Rory. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes, so do you want me to get going, Sam? Uh, uh, you usually get a late flurry. Okay, fine, fine. Um, and I say there's no, no time limit today, just um, whenever you're ready to finish, really. There's, That's fine. Down to one each week, so. Like I said, I've, I'm trying to keep my lessons really sort of open so there's something for everybody if you're a beginner in advance. So if you feel left out, please tell me. I can slow it down or speed it up. Um, I was just saying it's 30, 32 degrees in here and yeah, not ideal harmonica playing. It's a really interesting um, thing. People think I'm nuts. When I play with my band and we've done a few big stages, we played the Isle of Wight Festival twice, not the main stage, unfortunately, but the, the next largest stage, we're getting there. Um, and the sort of psychology you have to do before you get on stage and all that stuff and not getting nervous. I love it. It really is my thing. So my thing is normally before I go on stage, you'll see me jumping up and down back and my passion outside of the harmonica is boxing. So I'll start throwing some punches. All to that is to just get your heart rate up and to get you breathing and to get you moving so that when you go on stage, you're as relaxed as can be and you're as light as a feather. Uh, so but the problem is, in this sort of heat, if you start heavy breathing on top of a heat like this, you're going to wind yourself up. And what I really don't want to do is, if 
we're doing the, the pieces are deliberately easy because slow, easy pieces, it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or a master, there's always something to learn. But if you find it, if you are a beginner and you find it just a bit annoying, please don't wind yourself up about it. Uh, you just take your time with it, come back to it later. There's nothing worse than really pushing and the weather's hot and your cat's nagging you for food or whatever. You just lose interest in the, the instrument and I don't want that to happen. So yeah, deep breaths, let's just, let's just have some fun. Um, I'll give it another couple of minutes and then we can kick off. Any other great concerts? Thank you, Joe, for sharing. I'm gonna send you a million emails later. <laughs> Uh, Howdy, Trevor. Uh, Tony, Derek, hello to you all. Nick, Peter, I said hello to Peter. Uh, hi, Les. How are you doing, t um, Trevor? Are you keeping well? Yeah, not too bad, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Loving the warm weather. Yeah, absolutely. How about yourself? Yeah, like I said, sweating. <laughs> yeah. I think. Um, I'm pretty sure I could solve the energy crisis because my kitchen seems to absorb heat. So I'm pretty sure if we can use whatever technology it's got to turn it into a power station, I'm pretty sure I can serve, solve our nuclear problems and all this sort of stuff. Hi, Tom. Thank you for joining us. Uh, everybody else. Matteo, ciao. Come stai? Ah, oh, great to have you. Hi, Elena. Um, everybody else. As I've got one minute past. Do you want me to kick off? Yeah, you may as well, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, just mention about the free... Sorry, Nick Smith, thank you. has just mentioned about the free session sheets. Oh, uh, yeah. That's cool, still cool, available cool. on the website, so... Um, Ooh, easy time. I yeah. forgot about those, so I'm just going to go and uh, download them there. Yeah, no, no problem. I, I'll be bringing them up on screen. And that's... Um, that's a nice little introduction. I'll, I'll start there. Thank you all very much for having me. Like I said, this is hopefully going to be a fun, easygoing lesson for, that's got something for everybody. Um, I want to do my favorite thing first, which is saying thank you to, to Sam um, Wilkinson. And you're all muted, but can we please give him a wonderful silent clap? It's, it's, my, it's so awesome. And he's doing such a fantastic job. He's, he's cooked this up from nothing, and I think it's really been fantastic. Um, so thank you all for putting yes. that on. Uh, no problemo. Um, <laughs> um, like I said, I'm going to, we, we've got these three songs that we're going to have a look at super casually. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of throw you into them and then I'll just talk about them a little bit. And you can ask any questions in the comment section and step by step, we'll have um, points where you can ask me those questions and then we'll round up with more questions. And maybe if you want to play something of yourself, I think that'd be really enjoyable. Um, yeah. Um, I was really, really chuffed with the, the last little lesson I did for you guys a few weeks ago about establishing a practice routine. Um, and I wanted to sort of kick off the lesson, just a quick two or three minute recap on that. Um, how do I share my screen? This is where the fun begins. Uh, la, 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 la. Preview, there we go. This was actually the notes from last time. That's not what I want, hello. You've, you've got that document in front of you that says um, resources. <laughs> Guess what's in there? Um, that's me playing terribly. You can see a picture of the swan, me playing the swan, which is gonna be the first song we're gonna look at. Um, there's a little bit about me there. I do free lessons on the chromatic and the diatonic, um, obviously on my super high budget using my phone, um, but they're, they're free and they're there to help. Um, there's two resources there, which I really wanted to give you guys last time. Uh, one is Fran Schmel's International Course for Concert Harmonica. Um, Franz Schmel, I'm sure many of you know him. He was just an amazing classical player uh, and, you know, super fantastic. Seemed like a really awesome guy as well. Unfortunately, he passed away, I think, just over a decade ago. Um, but you can find him playing on YouTube. But there's, there's a little document there where he gives his course to the harmonica, and I think it's something everybody should read. Um, the other resource is Jamie Abersold's Jazz Handbook. And I think, I, as I mentioned last time, um, Jamie really sort of set out the process for learning jazz standards, and we're going to look a little bit at that today as well. And then, yeah, last time I gave you this practice routine, and I was really sort of um, uh, chuffed with the way it came across. Um, and I gave you this routine of warming up the harmonica using a chromatic scale. And I sort of explained, for me, crossing over from the diatonic, the chromatic scale really helped me learn where all the notes are on the instrument and sort of formulate a pattern 
for learning the instrument. And I think that's really important for you guys. Um, it's a fantastic way to physically warm up the instrument. Okay, it's, it's nice if it's a hot day like this, but if the reeds are cold and it's been winter or perhaps, then you need to bring the, the reeds up to warm temperature so that they, they perform properly. And I'm always trying to make boring things like the chromatic scale and stuff fun. So I sort of explained last time, well, you can do articulation, things like vibrato, tremolo, uh, and all that stuff. Then I said, you know, in your little practice routine for five minutes a day, look at something related to theory. We all don't like it. We all want to ignore the theory section and just get on with our lives. But again, I tried to make it fun for you guys. And I said, well, if you're a beginner or an intermediate, being able to play in every key on this instrument is, is fantastic. And you can set yourself an easy rate of learning one scale um, a week um, and learning the associated arpeggios. And you can do fun things with them by doing, you know, little different scale patterns, playing them in thirds and triplets, jumping between notes, playing octaves. There's so much thing, stuff you can do to make the boring stuff fun. And then I said, next in my practice routine, right, I've warmed up, I've gone over the theory hurdle, then I do my new repertoire. And these are the songs that I may have picked up for the first time, or I'm still learning, I'm still polishing them off. And um, I've sort of thrown you guys in the deep end with that today, because I've given you some songs. Some of you will have literally just clicked on them as you joined this, that's fine. Some of you might have been playing them all week, that's also fine. I'd be happy to hear, hear your, your experiences with them. And then finally, I said, at the end of my practice routine, last 10 minutes, whatever, play stuff that I know, I know how to do it. That way you're always ending your routine on a high. And I started before I properly started, I talked about musicians having mentalities. If every time you play, it's the difficult piece and you finish in the difficult piece and it's not there yet, you're just putting yourself down. It's important that you bring yourself back up and go, okay, I can't play Rachmaninoff's fifth concerto with strings, but I can still play Autumn Leaves or I can still play Summertime or something like that. And it's, it's really good to have that mentality and that success when you're playing. Um, so today I wanted to talk about that new repertoire, finding songs, making songs your own, playing about with them. And um, I also wanted to turn my sort of approach on its head, because instead of boring you with scales and routines, a lot of jazz guys just use the songs to learn things. There's, there's a wonderful flip, which is just letting the music teach you that stuff instead of just reading the book and reading the theory book and, you know, perhaps dissuading yourself. Um, so we're going to look at these three songs and we're going to break them down. Um, before I jump into the first one, we're going to look at the Swan first, which is a lovely, beautiful piece of classical music. Um, part of this, this process, I call it having songs on the go. And at any one point you can talk to me or probably most players and they'll be like, you know, I got five or six songs on the go and they're not there yet. They're going to take a, another month, another two months. There's one song that I'd love to play one day, but I really think it's going to take me more than a year. To, to learn it. So when you build this, this, this sort of process of learning your songs and finding songs that you think, ah, oh, that would sound great on the harmonica, I'd love to play that. Set yourself a time scale, have that song, maybe it's a jazz standard where, yeah, I can, I'm gonna be able to play that in two or three days, no problem. Maybe you can play it in an afternoon. Um, I'll debate that theory in a second, but oh, that song, I love that song, it's probably gonna take me a month to really do that or what have you, particularly with classical music, um, a lot of it is just putting in, in the time and just playing it at a slow tempo. I made a terrible mistake in, in my last session in that you, people asked me, well, what are you doing? And I tried to show off by saying, I'm doing the fast songs, right? I'm doing the Paganini. You know, it's, it's very impressive to play fast, but it's, it's, also, it's also, you know, cheating music a little bit. I was talking to a saxophone player friend of mine today and he said, uh, Sam, when you play fast, the best you can really hope for out of the instrument is to play the right notes at the, play, at the right time. Actually putting in articulation and feeling and a little bit of a groove, a little bit of style into your music, you need to take your time. And uh, several um, various music teachers of mine in the past have all said, there's only one reason we make mistakes. We're playing too fast. Either literally the tempo is too fast or metaphorically, you're not quite ready because you haven't got a technique of, say, playing octaves down yet. So you need to go away and play octaves. So whatever it is, just slow it right down and say, OK, is the metronome too fast? And am I just racing in? Or, you know, look at the piece of music and say, ah, this piece of music is talking to me. It's telling me that before I can play this, I need to know a certain scale or I need to do X, Y, Z. 
And the reason I chose our first piece, The Swan, is because it's the perfect example of that. It's almost like a Chinese finger trap. The harder you pull on it, the tighter it gets. The faster you go on this song, the worse it sounds. The slower you play the swan, the more gracefully you play it, the more beautiful it sounds. So last time I, I spoke about things like vibrato and tremolo. This is a lovely song to just try and do those <laughs> things slowly. And before I begin, I'm already telling myself, Sam, just because you're on camera doesn't mean you have to show off and play fast. Take a deep breath and play slowly. Um, what else would I like you to know? Yeah, uh, just take your time with it. So. You know, imagine playing that at 180 beats per minute. You know, <laughs> the, the audience would run out of the or out of the hall. So what I thought we could do first to just get you guys um, warmed up is I'd like you to just take a moment to, I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to just, first of all, compose yourself, play a chromatic scale to warm up the instrument. Or however you want to play it. And then the, the piece is in G major. I'm hoping you know what G major is. It's basically the same as C, but we throw in an F sharp. So then I'd like you to do that. And then if I share the screen, I don't want you to play the whole song. That would be silly. Um, why are you just showing me bluesette? Can we not? I want you to play the first, um, first six or seven bars, not past bar nine, if you can see the music up in front of you. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try and sort out why um, it's not sharing it properly. So yeah, just take three or four minutes and play that, and then I'm gonna have a chat about it, and by all means, ask me some questions about it. But again, just the first three or four lines. Um, I did say this is also a lesson for advanced diatonic players. One of the things I'm really falling in love with is playing a chromatic scale on the diatonic harmonic and trying to get it, but I'm, I'm still getting there with it, doing things like overblows and what have you, so yeah. That's my little thing. Warm up with your chromatic scale, play the G major scale, and then have a go at um, the, the swan. And I'm going to fix this. Uh, there we go. Finally, we're there, right. Play it around a couple of times. I'll give you another, say, two minutes to just have a have some fun with it. It's such a beautiful piece of music. It really is. One more minute. Okay, so th thank you for taking the, the time to have a go with that. Like I said, just take it in little, little chunks like that so you can see an obvious section that you could learn, you know, for five, ten minutes there, get that under your belt. And there's another section, section two, take five, ten minutes, get that under your belt, and so on and so forth to, to learn the whole thing. And, you know, by all means, take this away later and, and learn it because it, it's a lovely piece. Um, but to, to sort of continue with my point, though, in, in terms of what you can take away from this piece of music in terms of practice routines, um, 
I, I feel like David Attenborough now, because I'm always telling you about scales and arpeggios in theory and under the microscope. But here you sort of see them in the wild. Um, there we've got G, F sharp, B. If we were to add a D in there and go down to G, that's just a G7 arpeggio, uh, sorry, a G major 7 arpeggio. That's almost an E minor 7 arpeggio if we put a B and a, an E in there. So already in bar one, you've got the, the relative major and the relative minor arpeggios, which, which you can then take time to learn. And if you've got them in your mind already, then you've already got a pattern to come to this song really quickly and really fresh. Um, the next bar along, that lovely sort of long note on A. There you've got a perfect example of, you know, long notes. And you always talk, listen to jazzers, particularly people like Miles Davis that could just hold a note and get a really clear, consistent tone. So that's a, a, a perfect opportunity to, to look at your own playing and saying, am I getting a, a strong, consistent tone there? As I get to that, I'm going... Do you want to, you know, long notes are a perfect time to put in some vibrato, so... Another, and another lovely long note down there on the, um, the E. And again, I'm always badgering you guys, telling you you need to know your scales in every key. Well, this bit, which is probably the most, well, second most intimidating part, is um, all that is is G major, but we're starting on E. Or you could say F sharp going to F sharp. So it would either be um, E aeolian to F sharp or um, F sharp locrian. Um, whichever way you want to look at it. But if you just know G major, all you need to tell yourself is, right, oh, that bit with lots of notes, that's just G major, and I'm just going up the scale, but I'm starting on F sharp instead of G. So already you've got me nagging you about learning your scales and your arpeggios, but you can see where they're just naturally falling within the piece. Um, we have a little bit of a change there. We repeat ourselves, then we, if I was to play that on a guitar, I'd harmonize that with a diminished chord. Then we've got something a little bit more, more complicated here. I'm still racking my brain as to what this scale is. And if, if you know, by all means, by all means don't, don't keep it to yourself. The way I think of that is B major, but keep D natural. And that's just my mnemonic thing of reading that piece of music. That's what I'll tell myself when I get to that difficult part. I'll go, oh yeah, it's, 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 B major, but keep D natural. Um, so taking the time to actually not just see what's in front of you, but analyze what's going on behind of it. One helps you learn the song. And now later on, you can go, all right, first thing I need to do is, uh, well, I can learn my, my arpeggios. I can practice long notes and I can play my scales through. Um, and if you're taking this through to other pieces of classical music, you know, by all means, build up a little repertoire of your favorite composer or your favorite pieces and sort of run these exercises um, through. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Yeah, it's, it's, it's please do go away and learn that because it's, it's such a, a lovely, wonderful piece. And it teaches you the, this, this point of playing slowly and with a strong, consistent tone. Do I have any questions at this point? Um, anything somebody would like to know? Sorry, let me just find the comment box. Uh, there we go. You've all got that there, chat. One key of G is fine. Just da -da 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 -da. Hi, sis. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, whilst I was looking at it, I found it helpful to um, notate where to use, where I would find it easier to uh, use whole four and whole five yeah. in the charts because whether it's up or down. And I think that might help when I learn it to make it a bit smoother. Definitely. It's one of the tricks. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So I didn't see who said that. But um, um, yeah, it's one of the tricks. Whenever you've got a repeated note on, because you can obviously play C in three different places at certain points, you can play an F in different places. So for example, sometimes it's a bit easier for me to play an F major arpeggio without using the slide. It's easier to play an F minor 7 arpeggio using the slide. So learning those little tricks, yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. Um, 
of which way do I navigate across the harmonica, which is it more easy? Perfect, perfect. Um, great. Well, that, that was my sort of little opening um, gambit and in terms of approaching classical pieces and, and pulling things from the piece, not just reading it at face value. Um, again, in, in last lesson, can we mute whoever's now sort of... Uh, there we go. Yeah. Um, last time I had a, a fantastic question. I think it was um, from, from some gentleman. I can't remember. It might have been um, Anthony. And if you hear Anthony, say hi in the comments. Um, I mentioned that a good place to get repertoire is things like the real book. And um, people said, well, what is the real book? And I explained that it was this sort of compilation of people that had um, transcribed jazz standards and were sharing it on the underground. They were using, you know, pre, pre photocopying stuff, some things like lithographs and just sharing it. And having a collection of this stuff was known as the real book. And you'd have, you know, all the greats, all your Duke Ellington songs in there. And um, this was circulated on the underground for, for decades in the 60s and 70s. And it was just taken as, as sort of standard that if you took yourself seriously as a jazz player, you would know most of the songs in the real book, either off by heart or you'd be able to read the chart very quickly. Um, I'm just going to pull up those songs. So I mentioned Satin Doll in the last, um, the previous video. And uh, a gentleman was saying, well, what key is Satin Doll in? And it's, it's a really interesting um, question to answer because jazz people are always interpreting things differently. They're always talking about playing the changes. And I gave a very, very quick explanation of what playing the changes means. Um, so I thought we'd have a little look at Satin Doll next. And again, just it's quite an easy piece. Don't rack your brain on it on this heat. You can already see I'm, I'm going red in this heat like a lobster. But let's let's pull that up. And again, we'll do this thing of let's just play the melody through and then I'll ex hopefully explain this process of playing the changes and understanding what the composer was putting into the piece of music and what you can pull out for it in terms of um, practicing. Let me just uh, dig that up. Uh, oops. So yeah, if you do have Satin Doll already in front of you, it should have been on there. I do apologize. Um, I had to use my phone to get a, get a, a screenshot of it. Um, nowhere near me does um, scanning and photocopying. Um, and um, I find it quite romantic, actually, because all of this stuff was originally done illegally. People were illegally um, sharing th this music and compiling it without the composer's knowledge. So here I am illegally sharing it with you from my, my poor phone imagery. And uh, you can make of it what you will. Um, there we go, Satin Doll. And if, if you've got it pulled up in front of you because you've got the resources there, um, you'll see me that I've scribbled over absolutely everything. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, there we go. Perfect. I've got the hang of it now. Lovely. So... Don't worry about the, the ending. Um, if you're more new to the, the chromatic, just take those first two lines. Apologies, like I said, my pencil marks are everywhere. If you're a bit more advanced, play the whole thing through um, and, and we'll talk about that. I'll give you another two or three minutes to have a, have a go with that. Oh. And also, happy weekend, everybody, if I haven't said it already.
Okay, I think that's probably given you guys um, enough time to ha to have a look at that. Again, if you're a diatonic player, this is this is great for getting your your bends really precise, which is on. And um, yeah, it's it's a lovely little tune. Um, Everybody always has fun with this one. But the, the, the point I sort of wanted to explain is that in jazz, when you hear people talking about the changes, they mean all sorts of things, and you've got to, got to unpack what they're saying. So, for example, um, one thing you'll look for in the piece of music is the, what they call the key centers and how the, the key center changes, and it often changes with or against the circle of fifths, which is something I explained in the previous lesson. So if, if you're not familiar with that, do track back and have a look at it. Um, and last lesson, again, when I explained about um, the arpeggios, we saw that there's only, for example, one dominant seven arpeggio for you know, um, each key or that chord. And we tend to look for that chord to tell us to go back to the, the, the resolution, the, the, the key that you're in. Um, it's what they call the dominant or the fifth, the dominant fifth or the dominant seventh in this case. Uh, and that in jazz, you often hear about two, five, one chord progressions. So we can see that there's no sharps or flats there. So we know we're in C. D minor is the second in C, so that's your two. Um, G7 is the fifth of C, so that's your five. And then you would resolve to a one chord. But what Duke Ellington does in this piece is he keeps it going. So you've got two, five, two, five in C. So you know you're in C major there. And then he goes up. And, you know, E minor is in C, so, you know, it's questionable. We could be in the same key, but we've got an A7. Again, that's demanding resolution. What key does A7 resolve against? D, and so on and so forth. So you you can tell yourself already, right, first I'm in, I'm in C, and I'm moving around to D if you're improvising. Uh, we're there for two bars. And then we've got another change. We've made the, the dominant 7 into a minor 7. And D7 goes against G. We flatten all that. Um, so we're in F sharp briefly for one bar. <laughs> then we're back openly to um, C major and we're possibly going around again. Um, we've got another change here. G minor 7, C7. C7 resolves back to F. So we know we're back in F major. Then we're back to G. So <laughs> I've got lots of blank faces now, haven't I? <laughs> taking the piece of music and reading reading the changes like that is probably one of the first steps you're going to do. First, you're going to jump right in and you go, Satin Doll, I love that song. And you're going to play the head. You're going to play the theme. Uh, and that's, you know, what, 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 you, what we all enjoy doing. But then when you come to actually improvising it and knowing how the music is moving, you've got to take a second to just go, okay, this particular reading of Satin Doll has got these chords and it's telling me I'm going to C to D then G for one bar, F sharp for one bar, and then back. Um, this is where things get really annoying, particularly in jazz that I find all the time, and they just say this is why you've got to be super precise with it, is that I've seen about three other versions of Satin Doll using different chords around here, so that they're, they're phrasing it very differently, and they're getting a different sort of sound from it. Um, you can do things like chord substitutions, which I won't go into too much, but... Um, that's that's something you can look up so you can re reharmonize the piece and you can do all sorts of crazy things with it. Um, but I'm still, you know, getting there when it comes to jazz improvisation. So I'd be quite comfortable, you know, playing the head round like I did. And that's that's a lot of fun. When it comes to breaking it down further, you can, again, in terms of taking things you can practice from it, just play it slowly and say, right, well, can I play C, D, G, F sharp, F? Am I comfortable playing in those keys? Can I break down those arpeggios and play them one at a time? Or um, Adam Glasser, who's, who's amazing at this stuff, and I, I, rec I recommend lessons with him as well. He's fantastic. Um, he talks about you know, how you just play the arpeggios through. So does that Jamie Abersold book, because that's almost the easiest way to play these changes confidently. When you're playing the arpeggio, you know you've got safe notes, and if you're just playing around it, you're doing what they call playing in the pocket. And by that, they mean that on, normally on beats two and four in jazz, you're referencing a note from the arpeggio during your solo, during your big improvisation. 
that way you're always playing something safe and you're, you're keeping the groove together and you're moving with the music. You're, ch you're going with the changes. It's quite funny for me because I play in a blues and rock band. That's, that's what I do. And I'm always talking to my guys and they're always going, oh, Sam, you like jazz, right? I'm like, yes, yes. I'm having a lovely affair with jazz. It, it's brilliant. And they go, they just make it up, don't they? They just play any old thing. They just play a chromatic scale and get it right. And I go, no, they play the changes. And they, what do you mean changes? You know, music doesn't change. It's been, <laughs> they, they love winding me up. But it's, it's taking the time to actually see, right, another change that you're playing is what I'm trying to describe of playing each arpeggio and using that as the grounding of your solo. And that way you're always playing safe notes. Uh, I feel like I've just bombarded you guys with stuff. Any, any questions around that sort of stuff or anything you want to want to ask me? Well, Sam, I played Satin Doll for a number of years. Uh -huh. And um, I must admit that I haven't worked at an awful lot on the embellishment side of it. Mm. And it's quite interesting listening to you and putting some some of the finer points mm. on the piece of music. Um, I don't know that I'm one of the older generation, but I just like playing the song, basically. Perfect. Um, all right, if I can sort of phrase it in a nice way, yeah, fair enough. And I've got some very nice tracks. Yeah, um, brilliant. I've got about four versions of Satin Doll. Uh, the latest one I've just downloaded <coughs> and... Uh, if you've got time, I'll, you know, I'd, I'd put it on and get your comments on it. More than happy to, uh, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, I think at the end, um, we're just going to blast through Blues Et um, by Toots. And then I'm more than happy to take some questions for three or four minutes. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, by all means, feel free to play or ask anything else. Um, I got a lovely email from Anthony Craven. And I'm a part there you are, Anthony. Um, you mentioned that you did a recording of this, and he's not there by the looks of it. He's, he's gone to the kitchen to get another drink. Um, he mentioned, you, I'd be happy to listen to your version. You mentioned that you did a version, so I'd love to listen to that at the end. Um, but I, I hope that helps in that you can say, look at this and go, oh, well, this is a cue to learn this scale and to see how I could use that scale against this. And um, last but, but, but not least, I thought we'd look at Blue Zep by Toots Stillman's because... I always, whenever I think of Toots Dillman's, I think of the grandfather you wish you had when you were a kid, right? He's always smiling. He's got that lovely moustache. He plays so beautifully on everything. He's always such a happy chappy. And Blues Et is a lovely place that, again, I can sort of um, chat to you guys about. Let me just pull that up. Um, where are we? Blues Et. Uh, and again, don't go mad with it. Let's just, um, let's just look at the first two lines, as it were. Where have you guys gone? There you are. Let me just share my screen. I'll give you another few minutes to just... No, that's the swan. Uh, to just... Well, who's that? That's the one. I know what it's doing. I understand what it's doing now. It's, it's working against me. <laughs> there we go. Come on, toots. No, that's satin doll, so I have to do that. I understand, All right? Again, if you've got it in front of you already because you've downloaded it, by all means, jump in and get started with it. Um, there we go. And just at this stage, if you're not familiar with this piece, then just focus maybe on the first two lines and we can talk about that a little bit. Hi, Sam. Can you just play it through uh, a couple of times? Or ha! A couple of weeks? Okay. Sure. Sorry, your chat is blocking that next note, excuse me. So from the E flat. You can embellish it like that. Let's just... Honestly, all I really want to sort of talk about is this section here. So let's just focus on that. Again, slowly, don't rush it. Just 
just those two lines. And then you've got your, what I would take away from this, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and I'll play through some exercises for you. Okay, so <laughs> again, I'll leave you with this stuff because some of you may have never played this piece before and you're not just going to pick up something like that and some of you are going to be confident you are going to pick it up like that. Again, if this were me looking at it, at least those first two lines, the first thing I take away is, you know, it's almost like playing Scrabble or Sudoku or something like that. That first part there is just B flat major, but I'm starting on F and I'm only going up to E flat. So if you're familiar with um, uh, B flat major, um, there you go. Perfect. And B flat major is a lovely, um, a lovely scale to learn. I mentioned again in my, my previous little session for you guys that as you learn each scale, you'll become familiar with the little patterns that open up on the instrument. So the, the easy way to think of, of B flat that I always start on is I actually start on G low, three draw, and draw with the slide in. And then you're just repeating that pattern on hole five. And then you've just got F in between. So that was G minor, uh, which is the relative minor to, to B flat major. But developing just a little pattern of just going, oh, it's and then repeating that pattern again, but this time starting on C. Having little things like that to yourself really sort of help you learn those scales quickly. So. Um, if you are more towards the beginner sort of side of things, um, hopefully things like that will help. Um, it's also a bit of a difficult piece because again, improvising jazz in three, four, it's always a, a little bit funnier. You've got to get that sort of swing feel to you, uh, which is something I'm still really, really working hard on. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Again, we can look at how the, the piece of music is, is changing. Um, this is what in the, the previous piece, the Satin Doll piece, we spoke about a major two, five, one. This little example here is a minor two five one, briefly, um, and they're using that to, to to key change. This is actually a very very small part. They use a very similar progression in autumn leaves, except that they stay on G minor, so it would be G minor, not F. But there we've got our the key that we're in and the associated you know major seven arpeggio, where we're moving away from it and into a minor key. The relative minor, but then we're using that as the two chord, and I mentioned the two five one, and C seven is um, fifth of seven. Uh, sorry, is the the fifth of F, and then here we've got a two five one into E flat major seven. We hold that for another bar. We've got another two five one into um, C sharp or D flat. So again, pulling that up, that's going to tell you what key you're in when you're improvising. Um, and it moves quick, so when, when pieces of music move quick, the easy thing to do is just play slow, long, beautiful notes, um, which is what Toots is doing. The other thing that I found really, um, really sort of interesting about this piece is, or what you can sort of look for when you're, you're developing your improv skills, and this is still something I'm really working hard on, um, is looking for um, target notes. And the, the notes that tend to give a chord its color are the third and the seventh. And that's what Toots is doing here. So there he's gone to the third of A flat, um, A minor seven flat five, excuse me, it's, it's, it's a hot day, is um, E flat. That's the third and that's G, the seventh. Now we're changing key. So he's making that very clear by highlighting the third. Um, and then again, changing key, going from, that would be a minor seven if we were still in B flat, but we're not in B flat anymore. So he's highlighting that we've gone to a C dominant seven with an, uh, an E natural. Um, I hope that sort of makes sense for you guys. That's another sort of thing you can practice is just as, as you're playing these arpeggios through is, is focus on those notes. Um, and that'll give you something else you can take away from things. And again, like the previous exercise, Ask yourself, am I familiar with the arpeggios that are going on here? Am I familiar with the keys that are going on? Uh, e flat is a big jazz key. So is B flat, to be fair. So just taking the time to learn those scales. E flat is the My Funny Valentine scale. That's how I remember it. And what have you. Um, B flat is autumn leaves, isn't it? 
um, and there you go. Um, so those are just a few ideas that hopefully will give you some inspiration so you don't just take the songs at face value, which is really fun, and that's step one, is play the melody beautifully, right? But then when it comes to the interesting things like uh, improvising or playing a rhythm just to back up somebody else who's, who's improvising, being able to move with the changes and being able to, to look for the, the highlights that the song is telling you to look for, I think that's, that's a really fantastic um, skill to have. Um, that's all I've really got to say to you guys at the, at the moment. Um, thank you, as always, for your, um, your attention. I appreciate this hot day, and some perhaps my explanations are a bit convoluted, so please ask me questions to unpack them. Um, the, the benefit of me doing these things now is I get a, a little two minutes of self-promotion. Um, I did a lovely little album. Uh, there we go dedicated to Scott Joplin, back to my previous point about choosing a classical player and using them to build a repertoire. Um, I did an album earlier this year dedicated to Scott Joplin. Um, so please do go out there and listen to that. Um, musicians don't really get paid anymore. Spotify doesn't pay me. YouTube doesn't pay me. Um, but that's okay. I, I'm, I'm happy doing this stuff as long as there are sort of listeners for it. Um, my next album, which I'm hoping should be out, in the next two to six weeks, as I said at the beginning, um, is a tribute to Jimi Hendrix, which is going to be very different and perhaps not what you came here for, but um, it'll be very rocky, lots of diatonic stuff, lots of chromatic stuff, and lots of me playing the guitar. Um, when that comes out, please do, do support it, share it, tell your friends about it, download it. Um, you'll be able to listen to it on YouTube, like it, subscribe to my channel on YouTube. There's, there's free lessons on my channel. Um, everything I do is free. It's all about just getting it out there, sharing what you know, and seeing the instrument take off. And um, yeah, again, thank you for your support. Thank you again, Sam. Can't say thank you to you enough. And um, yeah, anything else I can help with? Are there any questions at all? Sam, have you done Little Wing? I, I have done. I've released that as a pre-release, and it's an early mix, but I've now done the final mix of it. So yeah, little wings on that. Um, I'll be sending it to you. <laughs> Ooh, that was... And, sorry, I have a question and that, uh, about it, uh, for instance. Do you think that it's always done consciously uh, in the sense of target notes? We, we see it when we're analysing it or when you're analysing it. Yeah, sure. It's very obviously target notes here. Mm. But could it be that um, the musician uh, in, uh, in question that Toots has just written a beautiful melody, then added the chords of to Of course, it, of course, and, yeah. And uh, that's um, because the chords are appropriate, uh, it appears almost as if they were targeted. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toots is Toots. He's, 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 he was still the coolest chromatic player ever. I know there's some big names out there. Um, who we can all tell, we can all, you know, spend hours telling you our favorite chromatic harmonic players. But Toots is just Toots. I think he, he's cool. And I think all players are exactly like that. Like you say, sometimes you do consciously, I sit there with a the guitar and go, oh, if I did this chord, then surely I should do that chord. Sometimes I go, well, no, screw that rule. I'm going to do this chord over here. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the joy of music. Same when you're writing a melody, you just sort of, I, I can imagine Toots just, he's a whistler, isn't he? So you just go, <whistles> you play that melody just whistling it and uh, yeah I, I think I'm, I'm doing this so, so the, the idea behind this lesson was to to give you things to sort of pull out and sort of just practice and just maybe help you take a different angle at the song as to to what you would otherwise sort of do um that that's my sort of approach but yeah toots coolest guy in the world everybody so, go ahead so I'm, I'm a real raw beginner on on my CX-12. Sure. Um, I've only had it a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and I've noticed that holes 10, 11, and 12, I come from a diatonic, mm -hmm. but 10, 11, and 12 are quite different to play nicely and cleanly than the rest of the going back down to hole one. Is that common? Um, Again, similar to a diatonic, sometimes when you go into the top octave, you've got a almost change your embouchure a little bit. So it might just mean 
you're, you're really pinching your cheeks there, whether you're tongue blocking or uh, puckering. puckering. Yeah, it's, it's going to be your cheeks. And the, the breaking the reeds in, um, particularly on a 612, that's a Hona harp. So the brass reeds sometimes need a, just a, a bit longer to, to break in and get a tone from them. Okay. Just warm up the whole harmonica every time you play it with that little chromatic scale. And as you go, as you start to get to that top octave, be conscious about how your body moves because everybody moves slightly differently. This is why I was telling you at, at the start, I was saying how when I warm up, I jump up and down to get my body, my heart rate accelerated, my lungs moving. Um, people have different ideas on whether you keep your head still or move it or whether you do this. It doesn't matter as long as you know and you analyze how your body interacts with it. So I'd say just try just pinching your cheeks in a little bit more. So. You're also, what I find is you're directing a thinner stream of air through whatever embouchure I'm doing. That was, the previous one was puckered, that was just lip pursed. Both occasions I'm, I'm closing the gap um, just more and more. But don't force it. <laughs> okay, just, just nice and gently Second and warm question. the root up. Yeah. Okay, yes. What harmonica are you playing yourself? Is this a Seidel? Yeah, the ones? I'm very, very proud to endorse Seidel. I, I really like them as a company, as a business. So the, the, Which one is it? Uh, I like all of them. If I like the stainless steel reed ones. I will show you. This is the one I really love. It's their cheapest stainless steel one. It's called the Deluxe Steel, and it's light as a feather, and you throw it in your gig bag. Like I said, I play with a rock band, so I'm throwing this, I'm dropping this on stage all the time. It still works. Um, well, the what? Steel? The Deluxe Steel. Oh, that's going to come up yeah. backwards, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, other way up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but they also do the Saxony and these these lovely symphonies. These are like, this is what I'll record with when I'm lucky enough to be asked to record. I'll go for these guys. But these two are still just absolutely gorgeous. And um, the guy the I mentioned... The lightest one is the Deluxe. Yeah. That's because I've got a bit of arthritis oh, in the perfect, thumb. No problem, so problem, yeah. I'll go for the light. It's really light. It's so quick and so responsive, this one. <laughs> What have you? Thank it's, you. It's just fast as Thank you want to be. Thank you very much. No problem. Much appreciate it, Sam. Sam, a question from me. Yeah, go ahead. I've, I've just started um, doing a little bit of jazz. I've actually bought um, diatonic, but it's augmentedly, or, or, augmented tuning. I saw your Facebook post, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and it's, to be honest, it's, it's like starting to play a totally different instrument. Because, Tell me about because, it. Because it's the, being used to diatonic for so many years, you know, you, you, you're thinking in, um, not notes, but mm -hmm. sort of scale degrees where you are at the up, up the scale. Whereas with this, this thing, it's, it's more about the notes. So what? So my question to you is: When you're say if you play an arpeggio, mm -hmm. what is going through your mind? Is it the shape of of the arpeggio, or or if you do a scale, is it the shape, or is it the actual notes themselves? Um bit of both and that's a really really good question and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the same boat as you um, for years same as this what I do with my band every night is just blues on a diatonic <laughs> you know the same old stuff that we all know and then about December of last year I finally tweaking these things to get the overblows so I'm, I'm doing the different method to you and just mm. It is, it's important that you have these moments that you're constantly learning something new. And it's like snakes and ladders, you know, all of a sudden everybody's yelling my name to, I can't play this thing chromatically. It, it takes me ages. Um, on the chromatic, I've got the notes memorized in my head now, better than I do on the guitar, actually. Um, in terms of theory, the chromatic is sort of king for me. And... That's why I'm struggling to do what I think you're trying to do is to play chromatically on a diatonic that's specially tuned because the chromatic is close, but no cigar. It changes in the top octave, the middle octave and the lower octave, the breathing patterns. So the middle octave is perfect because it is the same. Almost. Actually, no, it's not, is it? Because the B flats in a different place, the F sharps are blows, whereas on a chromatic they're draws. So I, I, it's hard for me to say, Sam, do this because I'm I'm paddling the same boat with you down the river. What I'm finding is this 
routine for me, which is just five minutes a day of, can I play the chromatic on this? Can I play a chromatic scale on this? And then calibrate my mind to it. Then doing one scale a week and that. And it's quite a nice symmetry because that was also me about five or six years ago on the chromatic. Uh, um, but yeah, mental models are really important. So you, you both need to theoretically know where all the notes are in your mind and your mind's eye, but then also have your, your sort of cheat sheet. Like I mentioned with the F major and F minor arpeggios, just having that way of gliding across the instrument. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's tough, but that's what it's about, right? Having these challenges. Well, what I've done is to, to get to know where the notes are is, is just to take I think, about five or six, you know, the, the standards, you know, summertime, yeah. um, um, uh, autumn leaves, shall of your smile, um, this I may not show, um, mm. those sorts of things. So I'm starting to know, I mean, I can sort of read music, mm. you know, over the years I've, I've had to go to do it properly, but what I'm finding now is I'm actually reading the music to play yeah. notes rather than um, sort of knowing where the notes are just, mm. um, without the music. Does that make sense? Definitely, definitely. I mean, you want to hear how bad I am at it. I'm doing the same thing. I am, like I said, I'm, what I'm working on is getting the intonation on these these overblows and overbends. Yeah. That's the, the hardest part. So you'll hear me play it flat. Uh, the swan. See, I haven't even got it yet. Just that one little in there. Um, I was doing a song. I'm sorry, I don't have it up and I normally need the sheet music. Um, which is by Dvorak. And then trying to play that on this. Nightmare. Excuse, uh, helps if I pick up one in the right key. <laughs> you know. I think the chromatic sounds much nicer, but you're right, it's a fantastic exercise to do. And you listen to people like Howard Levy and, uh, you know, guys, Mariano, Mam uh, Mariano Masalo is the guy who does gypsy jazz on it, and they're fantastic. But it's important that you see this as well, because this is the, the iceberg effect, isn't it? You see them on stage or doing their little DVD, Howard Levy's, you know, Mastery of the Harmonica, and he, he has mastered it. But you don't see the, the hours every day of just working with a, with a tuner, a guitar tuner, you can download that stuff on your phone for free, just a guitar tuner to see, are you getting that note sharp or flat? Yeah. Doing that for five minutes, it's a lot of discipline. Um, that resource I gave you by Fran Schmel on the resources sheet is just like, a classical player will play between about five and eight hours, and that's what he did. I used to work um, for Yamaha Music in London. I was their guitar salesman, so you'd see me down the basement, but um, we had a lot of classical pianists come into the, 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 the sort of piano section and they, they say, yeah, the classical pianist plays for a minimum of six hours a day, probably more rea realistically like eight to ten. Now, your lips are going to go on a harp player. You'll get the, they call it, it became a legitimate um, medical phenomenon because of Louis Armstrong, who also used to play for so long, his lips just started, you know, fracturing to pieces. So that, if you've, if you've done your four hours and you're super tough and your lips are made of steel, you know, well done to you. But what you can do in the other side, what they'll do, what a lot of guitar players do, because guitar players will get tendonitis if they do that, because they're <coughs> supposed to sit like that, is they'll actually take the pieces and they'll do this. They'll say, what is my arpeggio there? How is the music changing? And they'll almost visualize those changes. Um, and that's something you can do on the train to work. It's something you can do um, while your partner is reading a book or watching a horror film or what have you. <laughs> <laughs> or a chick flick yeah a chick flick yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay that, that's that's really interesting like you say it's um it's all given me some great insight and um so I'm, I'm just still very very early days mm. um I me mean, too it's, it's, me too it's, it's a really really interesting tuning I mean basically you've you've just got um two draw bend sorry two draw bends on each hole so each and each a hole is four notes, but it's tunes like so, so, so 
you can't you can't think of it as a diet on it. No, yeah. Or you know, um, do tongue blocking and, and found it's it's just for the um, just for the solo notes, which I say it's it's totally alien to me. So it's 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 been quite a um, quite a steep curve. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. I'm, I'm trying to do at least an hour a day. Which yeah. Is, challenge um but um uh you know it's uh hope, hopefully after a i don't know by the time i'm 76 or something mm. like that i'll have uh <laughs> I'll, I'll have mastered it <laughs> what how long is that sam so, this one <laughs> sorry what make of harmonica is it it's it's a it's um sidle but, but what they do is they'll they do custom tuning so if if um, you know, I, I, I like the the eighteen forty sevens. I mm. you know I think they're the best best harmonicas there are personally. Um, but they also you can like you got all the other I suppose more standard tunings like your harmonic minor, natural minor, um, the melody maker, those those sorts of things. But they're on their list on the in their custom shop. The augmented, that's the one you're doing. Yeah, augmented. But you could do, you could get them to do any tuning that, that you want, you know, mm. which is um you know, just literally clicking on um on each hole and on what note you want on each hole. But it's um Are you trying to play beep up on that, is it? To be honest, I'm just it's something you know, I've always always had quite an interest in in jazz but never managed to get round to mm. learning to play it. I, I did try it on the guitar about um 15 years ago uh, I, I thought uh, Chuck called joe pass Barney yeah Pass, all those sorts of players amazing but right I'm, I'm i'm gonna become the next joe pass and then realized i probably have to spend 10 hours a day yeah um practicing be, be high on something I don't know, <laughs> and uh it, it, and uh, so I still got the guitar, but uh, but I just I just didn't have the time um, to, um, to to give to it, and it's similar to the way I played played well played up to about five years ago. Bass was probably my I'd say oh. my first instrument, which is totally different to, to you know um, being in these sort of um, the backup part of the band. Um, I was more used to that. So, so when I joined a blues band and was sort of at the front with the harmonic, and that was a, a totally different, uh, different experience. Um, but to say it's, I, I did start. I, I, I thought about doing what Sam was doing and doing it on the, the, the with a normal diatonic tuning with, um, you know, getting I the overdrives. Yeah. But I think the thing that. The struggle that I had is is that with normal diatonic harmonicas, you think of positions. Yeah. Um, and I think I, you know, I had a good chat with uh, Martin Dijek. Who, yeah, yeah, you um, said yeah, yeah. Who was who was here a few few weeks ago, and he was saying that when you got one of these things, you don't think positions. Mm. And I think I think that's that that is the sort of the key thing to start mm. with. Um, and I think in a way that's why I needed to go to get away from a normal diatonic because if if, mm. if it was starting on what would that be like say c harmonic if it would be <coughs> flat then you you know you, you you'd be on a um overblow four yeah um as as your first note of of, of that chord and you're thinking that's that's not my favorite note to start on <laughs> so um and again it's just something different just just um just playing around with something different yeah I I always go back to the diet, diatonic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the, the, the as you say, Sam. It's, it's like a nice, comfy, comfy pair of slippers, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. No problem, guys. Uh, anything else, or does anybody want to play something? Or my email is in the website, or you can contact me. As I said, Anthony, sorry, hey. I, you sent me an email. I tried to email you back, but I got mailer demon, and I can. So if you do email, email me, I'm happy to talk, whatever. But just make sure you include your email in it, so that I can definitely send you something back. Um, yeah, everything is on my website or on YouTube. You're more than happy to just have a chat about this stuff and help you out. Sorry, what I just noticed there was a note earlier from, from Jim, aka Walter. Um, I don't understand my target notes. Now, is that um, notes of the 
of the chord that you're playing. Yeah. So, so, if, so when when you're in that bar, that measure, if you're playing over a um, uh, <coughs> pick a chord, so you're playing C major seven. Um, the the notes in a C major seven that really give it its tonality are the third and the seventh. Mm. So jazz players in particular tend to lean towards those notes and target them at least once. Third. Because that, <laughs> that then gives you that, so it's a bit technical, but that, does yeah. that then give you that flat five <clears throat> substitution, does it? So yeah. if, That's tritone substitution, I think. Is oh, that what you're right. talking about? Um, Don't ask me about them. They scare me. Like I said, I only do five minutes theory. <laughs> I'm getting to those. They, they, this is a perfect example. Like I can learn my scales and my arpeggios and I can look at a piece of music and go, that's 251 to that. And now I'm in that key. Oh yeah, he's implying a harmonic minor there. And then there's always the next thing that's your next little iceberg. Yeah. Right. And several times I've, I've brought up YouTube clips of clever people, much smarter people that went, had a formal education and what have you. And they go, try to own substitutions and I just fall asleep. And yeah. um, my understanding of it says that if you're in C, so satin doll, so my theory, and I might be completely wrong in embarrassing myself, is that I'm not going to pull it up again, but the, the last bit where it goes to F sharp for one bar, F sharp would be the tritone of C because it's, yeah. it is a tritone. It's the flat five, like you said. Yeah. But then I think it's also related to altered scales and um, um, what have you, whole tone scales, whole tone half tone scales that you can use over a tritone substitution because that part of satin doll is all in flats. <laughs> So B flat and um, A flat aren't in C, um, and so it, it, thought, it's smoothing thought, that in. I, I got nothing for you now. So. <laughs> I've got one last question for you then. You, you say you learn your scales. Now, do you just just learn the literally the major scale, or do you then go into the different modes like Dorian and? Yeah, yeah, we did that last time. That was the yeah. thing. So. I, the, the easy way is, is from a, my guitar player brain is that you're playing the same scale but just at a different yeah. place. But on the on the harmonic uh, on the harmonica, it sounds much nicer when you do play your modes through, and you just tell yourself that. And last time I, we we said this, and it's, it's a good idea to go to the ninth and back so you can get a flying thing to take C major again. Yeah. And that way you can get flowing. You can just, while the adverts are on, you can do that. That's your five minutes of theory while the adverts are on. And go all the way through, do it through different keys. Then what have you. Um, I tend not to worry so much about the pentatonic. So what, what people like Adam Glasser have, have told me, and I had a guitar teacher for like a group guitar when I was like trying, still like yourself, trying to learn jazz guitar. And he knew Joe Pass and... Um, mm various other people kenny burrell he knew as well he was a fantastic player mm. they all the jazz guys put their emphasis on the arpeggios and when my rock my band my rock band say it's all about you know just making it up if you're playing jazz i'm like no it's because most rock people tend to think in the scale the pentatonic scale or mm. the rock scale was the jazz guys they go whoa, whoa i'm just going to read the arpeggios through and improvise around them based mm. on almost what i naturally hear and what i naturally know the scale the the, the um the key center is telling me for that little center and for that little yeah. section. And that's how they sort of move so quickly is that they can just look at this and, and, and go boom, 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 boom. Um, so interesting because um, one of my wife's friends is in a, in a jazz band oh. um, and they asked me to play every now and then and it was Fly Me to the Moon. So I think it's an A minor. Love it. So I thought, yeah. okay, I'll, I'll play that and I'll play that in third position on a G harp, you know, and, uh, avoiding the, the draw seven. Um, and they were saying afterwards, because you didn't, you didn't need to read the, the, the <coughs> chord sheets, the music, but because I knew the, the chords in my head, you know, because it's quite, it's mm. quite um, common. It's a lovely song, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the chord sequence is quite common and it's sort of, there's not that many accidentals mm. within, the, within the scales. Um, but now I, seem, I, I get now more of why they're there mm. looking at the chords. For their for their sort of improvisation, mm. um, you know, and, and it's just those little things that sort of click into place every now and then, you know. And it's interesting the perspective as well, because um, like the rock band, I'll say, will go, "Why are you looking at a piece of paper?" 
that's terrible as a band performance wise to just be stood there. If you see us live, we run around like lunatics. I'll normally do at least one point. I'll jump up into the audience and start dancing. You know, you can't do that with a piece of music and they're going, oh, shit, I'm in E flat now back to F. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a very different performance mentality, but also, you know, very different approach. As well, I guess. So. Would you like me to play this back and track now, Sam? Hit me, hit me. Yeah, it's um, it's a professionally recorded backing track for jazz players. Um, so it goes on about five minutes, but I won't play it, you know, time is an essence. Yeah. I won't play the whole lot of it, but you'll get the idea of it. I was say, Sam, you were looking very glow felt there with your uh, <laughs> strip on there. <laughs> Come, play me the chromatic harmonica, or else. <laughs> Sorry, that's Almost a bit like of a... Thing. So that was a bit of a negative stereotype doing the German accent. I do apologize. That was very insensitive. Sorry. <laughs> I voted remain. <laughs> um, while, while we're waiting, um, that's another good thing I can show you is if, if you use things like, I'll try sharing my screen again. Will it do it? Um, okay. Well, there's things like iReal Pro. Have people heard of iReal Pro? Um, oh, yeah. Just, yeah, just got that. Yeah, they're, they're really great stuff. Um, it's about 20 bucks. But um, it's just a, the chords. It's just the accompaniment. So if you've got something like the real book or something, you've got the, the head there that shows you the chords. And then iReal Pro is this app that you can get on your phone or your computer that will play the chords through with a little drummer. And you can do so much with it. You can turn the chords off and just have a bass and drums, which is what I want to sort of do next, maybe in about six months' time when I'm a bit more confident with this stuff. Just have bass and drums and then just me improvising on top and playing the guitar with myself and make some fun videos for you guys and um, just enjoy it. Um, really good app. Um, I've got another question. Here it goes, Sam. Okay, go on, Michael. Hold on. Yeah, it's lovely, and I love your your moving on the rhythms as well. It's really nice. I have to apologise at this at this t stage as well because I've just looked through some of the comments, and there's somebody called Harold Shipman, and he's been making all sorts of derog derogatory comments. That is my 
bass player Adam and he snuck into the last one and started making snide remarks and he's been <laughs> in this one again making snide remarks so he, he likes to take the mick out of me and we we, we do that we, you know you can't put four men in a room with it, musical instruments and not have them take the mick out of each other and as soon as I get something like this where I'm, I've got a bit more of an ego boom he's right there in the comments bringing me back down again we we have a rule in our band that there are no egos you will have to be nice but yeah if anybody gets slightly ahead of the others boom i, sort of, I sort of suspected that one, yeah. so like, you know in some of the comments i thought all right i'll, I'll let sam deal with that you'd think it would be tasteful <laughs> that's why i've written get out adam because his name is adam rick and uh you know what? There are so many stories I could tell you about that man and where he's screwed up, but I will be a class act. Um, any final questions or anybody else want to play something or ask anything? Like I said, go ahead and email me. I'm always happy to have a chat. Walter, thank you for telling me about Jimmy in Manchester. Um, yeah, don't do drugs. My, my ex-drummer took every drug out there. We kicked him out. Um, I've been very much against drugs all my life. I enjoy uh, There's a Madeiran rule. Uh, most of my family is English, but my grandfather was Portuguese, and we have a saying that one glass of wine a day makes you live forever, two glasses puts you in the grave. So that's knowing how to be sensible. Why am I talking about this, Sam? Sam, <laughs> Sam, get me out. <laughs> Why am I talking about this stuff? I'll ask you one more question. Go do ahead. You, do, you learn this, do you learn those songs in different keys, or do you just stick to the one key? This is a really important thing, and what I'm trying to do is to take phrases and move them in different keys okay. um, for now. There's, but you'll also see things like, so you play Fly Me in the Moon in A flat, I have an E flat. A lot of jazz writers, I know three versions of Autumn Leaves, one in G minor, one in E minor, and I want to say the other ones in, I want to say D flat minor. So, F, F flat. Uh, sorry, <laughs> D, D flat, I thought I said, sorry. <laughs> Uh, C sharp. Um, so yeah, to an extent they'll do it themselves because they'll all know the different versions and it, it's a great thing. I did, um, I had this, I know a guy, he does the jazz channel on jazz, uh, sorry, the saxophone show on jazz FM and he's like one of the top sax players in the UK and I've had a few lessons with him just talking about jazz and I tried to show off to him so I learned a few Charlie Parker things and I was like, all right, watch this. I've already messed it up. And he was like, why are you playing that so fast, Sam? Nobody plays it like that fast. You're not Charlie Parker, play it slowly. Then I can play it. And he was like, yeah, take little phrases like that and just move them into every key. So that piece, for example, starts on D and it goes through G. So then you can take that as the, you know you're in G major, so D is the fifth and you're going through the minor third. So you just, apply that to another arpeggio and then you can sort of fill in the gaps from there. Um, I need the music up to play it properly as you can probably tell by how awful that was but um, yeah I did a I did um, on my free chromatic lessons on YouTube which you know again done with a super Hollywood budget um, not just my rubbish Samsung Huawei camera phone or whatever I did summertime um, and played that through in every key, because that's a really lovely song to play. Um, diatonic players normally play it in D minor, because it's third position on a C harp. But then you can play that in A, because you're starting on the fifth and you're going down to the fifth. Um, G minor. And what have you. Um, pick a key, any key. You're just, because again, you're thinking summertime is built over a minor arpeggio. Here it is on a C harmonica. Um, you can play it in an A minor there. Um, what's the other the minor? E minor. No, I played that wrong. Uh, a B. It's fifth position, is it? and what have you. Um, you're just using the arpeggio as a basis to learn it, and then you're just filling in the gaps. Um, yeah, I need to do much more of that. Transcribing solos by ear is the other thing. So those two is, is taking little little chunks of, if you like, that little run that somebody does, then noting that down, perhaps by ear, if you're better than me, 
and then just moving it through uh, some of the more common keys is what my, my friend told me to do because you know you do all 12 you're there for an hour and you, you start doing this by the end of it and you're like can I, can I go home now but <laughs> just you know the, the major jazz keys you know F B flat like I said jazz is always thinking flats not sharps um, which I think is a big thing for chromatic players to get into the head because chromatic players instantly see sharps as a good thing because you're yeah. sharpening it but actually flats are probably easier and more fun to play they give you more slide movements so like um oh. that stuff is much easier as a flat key if i played that in a it's a nightmare a and sort of b are the nightmare keys for a c chromatic but the rest are no yeah. Even scary ones that ev the, 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 everybody thinks when they look at a piece of music, like a guitar player or a vi probably more a violinist wouldn't like looking at F sharp or a pianist certainly wouldn't because that's the one with the most sharps and the most flats. But it's back to having these mental models because for me, F sharp is sliding on everything except B, keep B natural. So it's... There's F sharp, easy, because I've got that little model. So again, it's getting over these fears, what intimidates another instrument probably is actually a little bit easier for you. And don't back down from it, step up to it. Uh, I think Claire de Lune is in that key or a key close to it. And what have you. Um, it's, it's a really, really nice piece of music. Just take your time, go slowly. That's the lesson I'm always telling myself. Because yeah. Probably like you, I'm a guitar player, so guitar players are always like, oh, we got to show off, we got to play as many notes per second, that's what a solo is. And it's like... My, my first band was a, was a metal band. Um, <laughs> I, I was the vocalist, so... Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I've still I've got more hair than that uh, now. No. Nah. <laughs> so. yeah. um, that's pretty, I suppose that's the way I think of jazz, is it's, it's, a, it's a journey with mm, no destination definitely. really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Good, good question, Sam. Yeah, hit me. Just one, one thing I've been wondering, obviously, where you, if you're playing jazz, you tend to be playing with a lot of horn players. Yeah. Um, so I would imagine, like a brass band, they're, they're playing, so they're transposing, so they're playing B-flat and yeah. C. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, would you, as a, um, playing the harp as, as a, you know, in, in normal key, mm. as it were, would you, you pick up a B-flat harp? A chromatic and use that instead of a C one and read it as if you were reading C. If you were really clever, yeah, Trevor, yeah. Um, well, it, well, because surely it'd be notated in C, so you just play it, pick up a B flat harp, and you know? There, yes, you could do that. It would hurt my brain. Um, it's <laughs> it's kind of like you know how guitars have alternate tunings like Dad yeah. Gad, and I, I can't do that. I know where everything is the way I know it, and. So it's, does the uh, different tunings on the chromatic. Like, it's exactly the, you know, chromatic, the B-flat chromatic is exactly the same as the C-chromatic. I mean, it's it starts on B-flat and then the pattern is yeah. the thing. It's still too much for me. <laughs> I'm a simple yeah, man. Right. <laughs> I, I really am a simple man. No, you're right. You are, you're spot on right. Um, yeah. And you could read, you could read a horn section piece with B-flat. Yeah, and, and yeah. yeah, so you could, if, the, the, I was just, but you don't, you don't do that though. I was just wondering if that was a. It, I read for C instruments, so you could if if you had a, um, when they print the real book, for example, they they'll print it for C instruments, um, B flat instruments, and oh, right. E flat instruments. So if I had a copy of the real book in, and it was for E flat instruments, then yeah, I could run and get a chromatic and E flat, and just yeah. I would read C as C on the book would be E flat that I'm playing. Same as a trumpet player, because yeah. trumpets are only flat. So yeah, you could do that. But it's, it's part, partly it's up to you, so you could do that. It's also partly up to, if you're probably playing with a band, the arranger as well. Because you're right, he might actually want you to have a lower, if, if, if you've got one of these sidal tune things, it can go a lower E flat, which would be quite low, and, or it could be a, an upper E flat. So he might want you higher to pierce through at the right frequency, for example, in that key. He might want you lower. Yeah. So he might direct you to say, actually, no, I don't want you playing on a, a C chromatic. I want you playing, reading E flat, but playing an E flat harp as well. Or he could just say, no, I've notated it. Sam, the chromatic is typically, the chromatic is a, starts as a C instrument. 
I've written it for C there, you start there. But then you've also got people like, again, other people that give me headaches and keep me wide-eyed at night, and people like Brendan Power that do all the Irish tunings, because Irish yeah. tuning, looked, again, goes by only about three or four specific common keys. So he'll change chromatic for that. And it's, yeah. like I said, I'm a simple man. I, can't, I can play in one tuning on the guitar. I can play in one tuning on the guitar. But you are absolutely spot on. Um, you're right. And I'm, I'm catching up. <laughs> I've no idea. <laughs> you can play in lots of different tuned chromatics because I spoke to Brendan Powell. Yeah, exactly. If, if you're not reading, the minute you start to read, that's <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that, should we let you go now then, Sam? Yeah, it's all good. Thanks again, guys. Like I always say, just email me. I'm a nice, friendly, happy chappy. Always happy to help. That's brilliant. Next, yeah. next, we got Simon Joy. Ah, yes. Yeah. Good guys. It's, it's for everyone, this tremolo, diatonic, and chromatic. Ooh. And it's an introduction to three, two hornpipes. So, <laughs> something different. It's, um, silence both the same. <laughs> <I think that. laughs> Thanks again, guys. Ciao. Thank <laughs> you, Sam. Go Thanks on again. That. Thanks a lot. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers, everyone. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks,